let me introduce the first uh, speaker of this session, uh, who is uh, Jochen Bernaysen from uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And uh, I would say that, uh, yes, the screen is uh, uh, perfectly working. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, a sequential coupling approach for a fluid structure interaction in a patient-specific whole heart geometry. Please, uh, Jochen, the stage is uh, yours. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for the introduction and welcome everyone to my presentation. As mentioned, my name is Jochen Brenneisen. I'm a research associate at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering at the Kassel University of Technology. I'm happy to present some results on a study we did on a sequential coupling approach in the next 15 minutes. This work actually is a joint project with the colleagues from the Institute of Fluid Mechanics at our university. To start off in the topic, I once again show the slide of multi-physics and multi-scale modeling. And that's the problem we face when we um, want to reproduce the cardiac cycle in silico. We on the one hand have the electrophysiology, on the other side, elastomechanics, fluid dynamics, all three, all, all three physics and all of them in different scales between the spatial scale from micrometers to centimeters, as well as the temporal resolution between microseconds and milliseconds. And all this has to interact somehow and be incorporated in the model in silica. As we all know, the electrophysiology or the electrical activation is the point where the cardiac cycle starts. So this electrical activation would trigger the elastomechanics and the myocardial, myocardial tension development and the wall deformation, they on the other side would then drive the blood flow. So this is all something somehow linked somehow and we also have a retrograde effect from the fluid dynamics onto the elastomechanics. In our work, we focused on the fluid structure interaction, so on the right part of the slide, and we want to focus on elastomechanics and fluid dynamics and um, further investigate how you can already see there are the information that is flowing from the mechanics to the fluid dynamics, as namely here, for example, the um, deformation and the global pressures. On the other side, the way back is the local pressures. But uh, we, in, in our work, we wanted to find out how important this error here below is and how the local pressures would influence the elastomechanics. So in our project, the question arose to which degree the blood flow has a retrograde effect onto the cardiac mechanics. And this was, of course, important because the computer models, they always have to accurately resemble reality. So we have to be as precise as possible. But on the other hand side, we need to be as uh, effective as possible. So the computational time and costs, they should be kept low. And so we for sure need to figure out how the complexity of our simulation framework has to be. Like for example, the group in Milan, they have a real detail implement, detailed implementation framework. On the other hand, we, some other groups, they are more focuses, focusing on single physics and then maybe trying to link them. And the next question would be, would it be sufficient to have an implicit coupling? What do we need an explicit coupling? So all these questions and for all these questions, we need to find out how big the retrograde effect of the fluid dynamics onto the last mechanics really is. With this slide, I want to give a short outline of my talk. I already mentioned the two domains that are important for our work. And we're going to start at the mechanical domain, then we'll focus on the fluid domain, and I'll tell about all the boundary conditions. Secondly, we then focus on the middle part, so on this coupling, if it's a unidirectional or bidirectional whatever coupling where the information between mechanical domain and fluid domain they are exchanged we'll start on the left hand side with the initial geometry that we need for the mechanical simulation our 
geometry is um, obtained from medical imaging. So we use an MRI scan and a segmentation to construct our finite element for chamber whole heart model. You can already see it depicted in the right corner. And um, with this whole heart, we also use a sliding pericardium approach to model the boundary condition for the mechanical simulation curve. Additionally, we have a model of the circulatory system. You can see that all four chambers are modeled in the circulatory system and the pulmonary perfusion and the systemic circulation, they are used to have a closed loop or parameter element model. If you wanna know more about all the mechanical background and all this um, circulatory system also, I can recommend you our latest publication, which is listed in, in the corner here to find out more. For the material itself, we use um, different material laws. We use a hyperelastic material law for the ventricle. We use the law that was introduced by Guccione et al. And for the um, atria, we use the Muni River approach. As both um, need fibers to correctly re reproduce the deformation. Um, we had to assign them, and we do that by a rule-based algorithm that was introduced by Bayer. So that's the left part of the slide, the mechanical domain, and uh, start off. We can already see the fluid domain that is kind of linked um, by this unidirectional coupling here in the middle part. So you can already see that the deformation and the global pressures that those arise from the mechanical domain. So we do a whole cycle, uh, so a full heart cycle of mechanical simulation, and then extract the deformation and the global pressures and give them to the fluid simulations. You can already see here that the endocardial surface, the, the deformation of the endocardial surface is important for the fluid simulation, and that is extracted and given over time. Additionally, we need the systemic pressure as the input pressure on the pulmonary veins. And as the output pressure, we use the aortic pressure um, that is depicted in green here. You can already see that we prolonged these trunks here. And we did that to achieve a static flow in these pipes or tubes. I already said we use the endocardial deformation over time. And as the heart is deforming over time, we have a moving boundary. And that moving boundary is accounted for in the arbitrary Lagrangian Lurigularian formulation um, that, that we use. We model blood itself as an incompressible Newtonian fluid. And so we can solve the Navier-Stokes equations to account for pressure distribution and velocities. All simulation is done in the open source software package open for. Additionally, we need the valves for the left hand uh, for the left heart. We need the mitral aortic valve, and we implemented them as porous zones. Um, you can already see the graph here. They are um, controlled dependent on the flow. So depending if there is an in or an outflow in the ventricle, the valves would open or close. So we now know the mechanics, we know the fluid dynamics, and now we need to close the circle. And then is already the point where we um, investigate this lower error here and account for the local pressures. We can see here the result of the fluid simulation at, at the point in time. And what we did in this work is that we introduced a spatially resolved relative pressure. So for each element, time and in space, we calculated this pressure factor. This pressure factor is norm to the pressure, pressure range, so the difference between minimum and maximum pressure in that time step, and we subtract the mean value. <clears throat> While we add a constant of one, we then end up in a range between zero and two. So uh, I already show a first result plot, not, not, um, just to see how it, it would be. So. The main, the main number of values, they are around one. 
that would mean that the fluid pressure, the local fluid, fluid pressure is not changed uh, compared to mechanical one. If we have number, numbers below one, we have a lower pressure or even a higher pressure than the mean value if we are above two, one. And that pressure gradient then would be taken and would be given to a subsequent mechanical simulation. I again use this uh, sequential coupling scheme. So we would take the deformation and the global pressures and after the fluid domain, we would extract the local pressures and give that to me the mechanic domain. As I already said, we always focus on a whole heart cycle. So we have the initial geometry, compute one heart cycle of mechanical simulation, give the deformation to the fluid domain, then I compute once again a whole heart cycle and then give the pressures back to a mechanical simulation. And in this way, our loop is closed. So we implemented a sequ sequential cycle to cycling coupling scheme. And with cycle to cycling, we, cycle to cycle, we really mean a, a full heart cycle. To evaluate how this uh, approach works, we on the one hand often named the deformation in this talk. So we uh, had a look on the deformation. We introduce the Euclidean distance, and if we have two iterations here, so first iteration i and second iteration j, we compare the same point through our different iterations. And um, when we have the same point in time and space, we can just calculate the root mean square in Euclidean distance. On the other hand, for sure important are the quantities of interest for clinical relevance. So I also will present a PV loop later. Yeah, as I already presented all the basics and the algorithm, I will now switch to some results. And you can see here is um, the whole heart <clears throat> and depicted on it is the pressure gradient. You can see the range is bet between zero and two again. The, the main part, <coughs> sorry, the main part is uh, one, so we don't have any uh, deviations, but uh, especially in the atrial systole, which is depicted on the left side, we have a higher pressure in the low part of both ventricles. So um, as the value is above one, we have higher pressure coming from the fluid simulation as before. When we um, look at the ventricular systole, um, we can see a higher pressure around the pulmonary valve. So this is only the pressure gradient now. And if we use um, that pressure factor over time, we can also see in the statistics of the first iteration and the second iteration that we're mostly in the medium range. So um, we are, a lot of values are around one, but we also have the maximum and the minimum deviating a little. But if you now would compare the first and second iteration, you can clearly see that there is a really low deviation. So that always already gives the hint that um, we um, don't have too much change in the second iteration of our cycle. Um, you can see that the range is getting a little broader because we uh, better make, make better use of the pressure range we have. Focusing now on the Euclidean distance, you can see that uh, for one heart cycle, um, we are already in the range of millimeters. So in the first iterations, we have a maximum, iter um, maximum Euclidean distance between the iterations. So if I mean first iteration, we have the initial mechanical simulation, one time the um, fluid simulation, and then iterating back to the mechanical simulation again. And if we now compare this mechanical simulation to the initial one, we only have a um, Euclidean distance between them of maximum two millimeters. Even um, the most values are also already below one millimeter. I can also show the spatial distribution. And if you see the left ventricle, for example, you can see that the maximum error as already shown in the pressure gradient is around the apex and around the aortic, um, the aorta. Yeah. But if we use the same color bar and uh, investigate the median error, we can also see already see there are no local deviations. So we are already with the median in a range of um, one millimeter or below. So that's the result for the first iteration. 
if we now have a look on the second iteration, we can already see that the values are going a lot more below one and uh, even smaller. If you also take a closer look, you can already see that we're not in the millimeter range, but to 10 to the power of minus five millimeters. So we're already in a sub micrometer range. If we use the same color bar for um, the spatial resolution, we can see that you can't see really much. So um, if you would compare the results in one plot, you can see that in the second iteration, the distance is uh, around zero or not really measurable. If we compare the uh, PV loops, you can see that actually there is a difference. So we have a, um, a higher pressure and a higher volume um, of two, two to three millimeters of mercury and two to three millimeters. But you can already see that you can't see the first iteration because it's superposed by the second. So we can see also that in the PV loop that um, already after one iteration, we already reach a steady state. Uh, that lets me come back to the initial question I raised, uh, to which degree the blood flow has a retrograde effect on the cardiac mechanics. And we can say that we clearly saw a retrograde effect. And uh, when we investigated the Euclidean distance, we saw that after one iteration, we are below two millimeters. But after the second uh, iteration, already in the sub micrometer range. So that would implicate for a healthy heart already one iteration to be enough to reach a steady state in this sequential coupling approach and would be a strong evidence that this sequential coupling could be sufficient. For sure, for, for further studies, we would like to investigate a higher number of uh, geometries and also uh, use measure data to compare the results and to validate the model and even to try to uh, incorporate um, defects or uh, deceased cardiac heart. But, that's up to come. And with that slide, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer your question now. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, presentation. There is now uh, some uh, minutes for uh, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, yes, there is a question from Elias Carabelas. Please, Elias, go ahead. Uh, hi, Jochen. You hear me? Yep, perfect. Ah, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Just uh, brief, you skipped quite quickly over this slide with these uh, porous zones. Uh, did you say they're pressure triggered? Um, actually, it's not pressure triggered, but we uh, investigate the flows. So um, we investigate how the volume in the left ventricle is changing. And depending if it's growing or uh, also getting bigger, bigger or smaller, we would um, then the valve, um, more, yeah. Let, let it open or close. So it's dependent on flow, actually. OK. Thank you. OK. Thanks uh, for the question and also for the uh, point in answer. Uh, there is uh, another question from Alberto Zingo from Polytechnic de Milan. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I was wondering, uh, I saw that in your simulation, you use um, very long flow extension. And this seems to be very, very coarse compared to the remaining part of the mesh. Is there a reason, like for example, you saw that this improves some uh, stability properties of the, uh, of the scheme or not? Sorry, I, I didn't acoustically get the first part of the question. So, so we're using quite a coarse? Um, I, I, I thought that like, you're using very long tubes on the pulmonary uh, veins, so yeah. these for extensions, and I saw that they are very coarse. So I was wondering if there was a reason or like just for a matter of computational cost, or if you see that like using coarser mesh, it improves some, uh, let's say stability properties of your numerical scheme or the one you're using. Uh, okay, thanks. Now I got it, yeah. Um, we also wondered how, how long the tubes should be and how, how long it would be important that they are. And that's also a point we wanted to further investigate. Um, I think we just use that because we uh, want to ensure the, the steady state flow and stability of the solver. Um, that, that's, that's a true point. Um, actually, it shouldn't be too coarse. I think it, it looks from, from the mesh here, but uh, the resolution should be um, quite the same than the rest of the volume mesh. OK. Um, so in your sequential coupling approach, you basically do, um, so when you say one iteration, you mean like a, a whole heartbeat of electromechanics 
and then you um, and then you give the information on the endocardium to the for dynamics and you do another heartbeat right right okay. Yeah, okay it's always one full heartbeat as well in mechanics as well as in um, fluids yeah. okay perfect thank you very much welcome thank you again uh, is there any further question from the audience Actually, I do have a question myself. Uh, sure. um, you comparing, uh, let's say, different heartbeats, you noticed uh, a little difference between the subsequent, uh, subsequent heartbeats at a certain point. Did you also um, uh, compare your results with uh, uh, other clinical data in order to, to validate, let's say, the results that you obtained? Not yet. That's a point to come. So we really want to in investigate if, if it's um, with a higher number of uh, geometries and also with really measurement data. Uh, we want to compare. Yeah, that's, that's a good point actually to come. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. So is the, if uh, there is no uh, further question for uh, uh, Jochen, we thank him uh, again.